Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. It is the last day of the week and guess what? It is the week before Christmas and New Year. So we have Anand Tandon, market expert, joining us now uh, to talk about, of course, the year gone by and what to expect from the new one. Anand, welcome to the show. Merry Christmas to you in advance. Uh, it's not a very Merry Christmas for the bulls, you'd have to say. But do you think there's a steep sell-off coming or do you think that India will continue to perhaps, you know, exhibit the kind of resilience that it has been doing in the year gone by? The market overall has been uh, quite resilient, uh, you know, and even in other markets, I would argue that other than tech in the U.S., where one has seen a very substantial correction, the index per se has not done that badly compared to the kind of interest rate hikes one has seen. In India, I think the, uh, you know, you could make an argument both ways. One, the positive argument today that is being made is that, you know, the U.S. inflation has peaked out interest rate differentials will not increase, uh, will not uh, add up from here. And consequently, you know, you will find more money going into emerging markets. And in that sense, India will continue to now have an inflow. Uh, there is, uh, however, an equivalent uh, argument that can be made on the other side that uh, if you ex assume that China opens up, oil goes up, consequently, there is greater economic activity than earlier presumed, then the commodity prices that we've been seeing falling so far may not, and therefore inflation will continue to remain higher for longer. And in, in that context, you know, given the fact that India is not particularly cheap relative to some of the other markets, uh, if there are any inflows, it may not be enough to take the market significantly higher. So in both cases, as you see, the, uh, the upside is not very high, but right now the downside doesn't seem to be very scary either. Uh, usually, market doesn't stay in this kind of equilibrium, so you will find a breakout one way or the other. My own suspicion is that, you know, a month down the road, we'll be looking at the budget, and there can be some uh, scarier factors coming in from the market in terms of capital gains, etc. So I would still remain somewhat, uh, uh, you know, uh, easy in terms of increasing equity allocations at this stage. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, uh, take that point. Uh... Uh, Anand. Anand, hi, good morning. You know, <clears throat> let's talk about individual uh, pockets, uh, really. PSU banks, uh, uh, you know, had a frenzied move and uh, they are uh, down about 12. The, in, the PSU bank index is down some 12% now from last Tuesday's high. Uh, your sense on whether this is just a pullback and there is more to go here? Uh, because, you know, we've seen this, right? I mean, after such a large move, uh, they, sometimes there's a significant pullback and then, uh, you know, uh, once again, the move uh, starts. Is that the likely scenario here, or you think it's done? Well, I don't think it's done. I think banking is one space which will continue to do well, corporate-facing banks in particular. And PSUs typically tend to have a better portfolio for corporate lending than they have for uh, for retail. So as a consequence, they were providing a fairly undervalued uh, part of, this, uh, of the market. I think that correction is more or less done. From here on, what you're looking for is the growth that you're going to continue to get in the portfolio. So it now has become an equal balance between being able to set up, um, give out more credit, but at the same time, raise more liabilities. And that is where I think, you know, the private sector banks uh, benefit quite hugely. So to the extent those banks which have the ability to increase their deposits uh, will probably continue to uh, do quite well. So the larger public sector banks, I think, are uh, the ones that one would be looking at. And at this stage, I would argue that even though the private sector banks are more expensive, the relative valuation gap has come down quite significantly, and especially the frontline companies. And consequently, you may want to start re-looking at those because clearly as the uh, rates increase, the increase in uh, deposits is more likely to go to the incremental increase in deposits, more likely to go to the private sector banks. And therefore, they'll be able to manage their NIAs, I think, a little better. Uh, Anand, uh, morning. Globally, the COVID scare is back. As of now, the advice is that things may not be as bad as what's happening globally in US, China, in India. Uh, but do you think one should be ahead of the curve and perhaps start looking at some pharma diagnostic names? Because who knows, right, what happens six months down the line? Is that a play that you would look at tactically? Rima, I don't think it's possible to play that uh, scenario really in the sense of, uh, you know, trying to predict what happens to COVID. We have to really let it happen and see how we react to it. So it will essentially have to be back-ended. 
That said, you know, your question about whether one should be investing in healthcare and pharma, I think absolutely that's been one sector that has underperformed the market quite considerably for quite some period of time now. So while hospitals in general have done reasonably well, pharma hasn't. So over the last two, three years, that's been a bit of a, a dog in, in terms of performance. So if you look at the next three years outlook, I'm reasonably sure you'll get one uh, round on the way up. And therefore, this may be a good time to be getting in. You know, uh, Anand, we request you to stay on because we have the management of City Union Bank now joining us. Uh, the 